prayer. It's reaching out to God for what we cannot reach ourselves. If prayer really can change things, what kind of prayers should we pray? Hey God, if you could just help me ace this test and make it through fourth period, that would be great. How often do we settle for prayers that are just safe? But what if prayer could be something more? Big, bold, brave? What if prayer became the most life-changing, dangerous part of our lives? Let's see what God might do. Search my heart to show me what I need to change to align with you. Help me let go of the things I'm afraid to give to you. Help me be satisfied in you who never changes rather than the temporary things of this world. God, show me how I can impact people's lives on this campus for you. In my life, may your will be done. So growing up as a kid, I loved to play games. Any other fans of games in the house? Either you don't like having fun or you're not paying attention, all right? Just, come on, a lot of us like to play games. And in particular, when I was little, my grandmother was the one who really taught me how to play cards. And in particular, I hate to admit this in church, so I, offer, I ask for your forgiveness, but she was the one who taught me how to gamble. Right? We would play with pennies, and somehow I would always win. I think it was just my grandmother being generous. And then we'd get to the last hand, and I would lose everything. I, I have no idea how that happened, but as a, as a kid, I loved to play games. I always had a deck of cards, and, and we would play all the time. Spades, solitaire, hearts, and you name it, we played it because we liked to have fun. When I got into middle school, it was about that time where there were a couple what they call collectible card games that were becoming popular. In particular, there's a few that maybe you've heard of, maybe your kids or your grandkids collected or played things like Pokemon or Digimon, Yu-Gi-Oh! or Magic the Gathering. And as a kid, I was a Magic the Gathering fan. I collected, I played, I would spend all of this time to build these you know, decks in order that, that we could play. So as a teenager, this was something I did. And then I put everything in a box, and I forgot all about it. And it lived in a box collecting dust for many years. And in the midst of all of the moving and everything, as we were getting here, my mom and dad were moving as well. And they said, hey, we've got these boxes of your old sports cards and magic cards. We want you to have these because we need them out of our house. So I take them all and I, I put them in the garage and I start looking through them and I get really excited because I'm like, I haven't thought about these in forever. And about a year ago, one of my favorite places to go and visit, Disney, put out their own version of a trading card game called Lorcana. So I went out and I bought some, some decks and we created some of these uh, trading card games. And I've been playing since I was a teenager, so of course I know what to do, right? We make these decks and I, I tell my kids, hey, we're going to play one night. And we set everything out, and, and I'm showing Kayla how to play, and I'm thinking, I'm going to be the good dad who just totally whoops her so that she learns how to be, you know, put in the right place. And I'll tell you what, that kid humbled me. I don't think I've beat her yet. And I'm like, I've got like all of these years on you that I've been playing card games, and how is it that you beat me every time? But she's humbled me. And it's hard as an adult to realize that we need to be humble. Because we start to develop an ego, and we start to develop pride, and we start to well up within ourselves all of this history that we have. And when somebody younger or somebody better or somebody fill in the blank comes along, it becomes difficult for us to be humble because we carry a lot of baggage, right? 
And it's good every now and then to sit down with your kids or your grandkids and just be humbled by them. Because it keeps us in the right place to understand that God has called each and every one of us to have a disposition of humility. No matter how hard it might be, you and I are called to be humble. And humility is important because I want us to catch this this morning. So so lean in and hear this. Humility is the beginning of authentic repentance. For you and I to understand where we stand in our relationship with God, it has to begin with an attitude of humility, no matter how hard it might be. So by a shoe of hands, who's really humble? Wouldn't it be counterproductive to raise our hands and brag about how humble we are? Just check in to make sure we're all paying attention this morning. But for you and I, what I hope for us to hear is that if we want to be in a good, living, growing relationship with the one true living God, we have to begin in a position of humility. Now, we're in this teaching series walking through the topic of prayer. And as we said last week, we're going to continuously build for these three weeks, last week, this week, and next week, on how we can pray bold prayers. And church family, again, let me ask, how many of us want to be those who pray bold prayers? How many of us want to pray like Joshua prayed, as we talked about last week? Prayers where we have the boldness and the audacity to ask that God would stop the sun and the sky and the moon and the heavens, and that neither of them would move because God heard Joshua's prayer. How many of us want to pray those bold prayers? Well, I would think and I would hope that all of us would But yet, we struggle because sometimes we think, oh, I'm really humble, Pastor. I could never in my humility ask God for something big like that. That's not humility, that's arrogance. And we don't need to be arrogant, we need to be humble. It's in our humility that we begin to repent and we begin to trust and we begin to believe how good God is is and where God is calling us out of and where God is sending us off to. So I want us to take some time this morning and I want us to open up our scriptures and we're going to look at just one verse. Just one verse this morning, which for me is like, holy cow, one verse. Like, I'm 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 all about context and I want to make sure that we all get the context and I'll, I'll help to unpack that this morning. But we have one scripture verse we're going to look at, and it comes to us from the book of 2 Chronicles. It's in the Old Testament. In our Pew Bibles, it's page 338. So you can look the Pew Bibles, or you can follow us on the screen, but this comes out of 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, and it says this. God, in this passage, is speaking to King Solomon. So these are the words of our Lord and Savior. God says to Solomon, If my people, who are called by my name, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I, the Lord God... I will hear from them, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. And may God bless the reading of his word. So as we read this passage of scripture, there is a little bit of background that we need to know in order to fully understand what's going on here. In the Old Testament, God had called King David to be one of the leaders of God's people, the Israelites. David was not the first king. He was the second king, but he was the first good king. Now, David wasn't perfect, right? We know that he, uh, he struggled in friendship 
because he betrayed a friend in order to be with his wife. We know that David at times was fully zealous for the Lord in that temp, uh, in the house of God, uh, dancing, Scripture says, indecent. He ran in one time naked and just paraded around. It, it's there in the Scriptures. David on some occasions was very zealous for God, where on other occasions he was very... Uh, not, I don't know if depressed is the right word, but he struggled a bit. He questioned God. And we see this throughout the Psalms where one Psalm is, God, you are so amazing. And the next Psalm is like, God, where did you go? And just back and forth. But David was called a man after God's own heart. And he was the first good king. And then David had a son. He had a son by the name of Solomon. And Solomon was one of the wisest, richest, and most influential people to ever walk this earth. Solomon was given the task of building a new temple, a place where God would dwell. No longer would God dwell in the tabernacle, which was portable, could be picked up and moved. He would dwell in a temple that was permanent. So Solomon's given this task, build the temple. And as Solomon is building the temple, he gets to the end and he prays a prayer of dedication. Now, for us to understand this morning, there's two things about the temple we need to know. One, it's meant to be a house of sacrifice. It's the place where the people go and offer their sacrifices to God in order that they could be made right with God. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial system's in place in order that God's people could understand that sin causes pain, that sin breaks relationship, and that in order for God to make right humanity, sin had to be atoned for. So there's this sacrificial system. All of that is pointing to Jesus, by the way. So the temple is this house of sacrifice, but it's also the place where the community dwells. It's the place where the community comes and they tabernacle with God. That word means that they meet with God and they dwell in his presence. So the temple is where the community comes together and they offer sacrifices to God. That, that makes sense? So at the end of the building of the, the temple, Solomon offers a prayer of dedication. And as Solomon prays this prayer of dedication, he highlights three dangers that he wants God to intervene on, the, on behalf of the people for. The first is drought. In a society that was agricultural, when there's no rain, there's no food. When there's no food, there's hunger. When there's hunger, there's pain. When there's pain, there's sorrow, and so on and so forth. So Solomon is praying, God, hear my prayers. Hear your people's prayers. Send rain so we don't die. But he's also praying that God would do something about the locusts. Uh, a couple months ago, I was walking around the church, and there were these giant grasshoppers everywhere. And I can't remember who I was walking with, but we were both like, it, God is sending the locusts. We need to run. <laughs> They're everywhere. Like, they were. I have a picture. I, I should have put it up. But I have a, the thing is as big as my hand. And I don't do bugs. Like, they scare the, the willies out of me. So I saw it, and I ran. And I think Kayla was like, Dad, you need to, you, you need to not do that. But Solomon is praying, God, take care of the locusts, because when the locusts show up, what little crops that they had, the locusts would eat the crops. So now there's no food for the people. Again, no food brings hunger, brings sorrow, brings pain. But in addition, the third thing Solomon asked for is that God would deal with pestilence. Now, pestilence here is kind of this idea of sickness, this idea of disease, this idea of destruction and death. So Solomon prays, God, would you deal with the drought, the locusts, and the pestilence? So Solomon asks these things of God in his dedication of the tabernacle. 
Because Solomon is knowing that when the people come, or not the tabernacle, the temple, because Solomon knows that when the people come to the temple to offer sacrifice, they're also going to lift up prayer, and these are going to be the things that the people are praying for. Because those were the most important things in their life. Their home, their shelter, their diet, their community. Like these were the most important things for them. These are what the people were petitioning God for and praying for. So church, let me ask you. What are you praying for? What are the things in your life today that you are praying for? Are you praying for your family? Asking for God's safety and blessing and protection upon you, your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, maybe even the ones that are not yet born? Are you praying for your family? Are you praying for your job? Because for some of us, we're still working and we're praying in our careers that God would give us grace and strength to not hurt our coworkers, to not mouth off to the boss, fill in the blank, or that maybe it's the right season for a raise or for a promotion, and we're praying for these things, or maybe in our retirement, we're praying that we will have enough to last to the day that we meet our Maker. Maybe we're praying in our retirement that we don't get so bored that we fade away into nothingness. Maybe in our retirement, we're praying that we would find a place that we could give back and serve God well. I I know a place, and you might already be halfway there. What are we praying for, church? Because I would hope and pray as your pastor that all of us are in conversation regularly with God, that we are praying people. But for Solomon, as he dedicated the temple... He knew what his people were praying for. They were praying that God would show up and show off. And here's the amazing thing that happened. As Solomon prays this prayer to God, God responds to Solomon. And we see a part of how God responds to Solomon. Like a good parent... God gives Solomon an if-then statement. Parents or grandparents, we know if-then statements, right? If you clean your room, then you will get dinner. If you are nice to your sister, then you will not get grounded. If you do your homework, then you will get good grades. And for our kids, like, if you clean your room, then you will get an allowance. We understand these if and then statements that if something happens, then something else happens. And God uses this with Solomon. He says, if, if my people will do four things, if they will humble themselves, if they will pray, if they will seek my face, and if they will turn from their wicked ways. So let's, let's look at these. If my people, God says, who are called by my name would humble themselves. I love what C.S. Lewis said about humility. He says that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Humility is not the woe is me, I'm so terrible, I'm so little, I'm so nothing. That's not humility. People who walk around and like, oh, I'm just the scum of the earth, I'm so low. I'm like, that's not humility, but there are people who pass that off as Humility. No, humility is where we're not constantly thinking about ourselves, but we are also thinking about the needs of others. We're not so wrapped up with ourselves that we truly understand our place in this world. People who are humble are filled with grace. And again, let me remind us that this is where authentic repentance starts. So God is saying, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves. If we want to pray bold prayers, church, we have to humble ourselves. And then God gives the the audacious request that if you want to pray bold prayers, you have to pray. 
Growing up, I, I always heard that if you want to win, you have to participate. If you want to win, you have to participate. But some of us, um, we live in the world where we dream about what would happen if we win the lottery, but we don't play the lottery. You can't win if you don't play. And I'm not advocating to go out and gamble. Listen, that's not what I'm saying. But a lot of us like to dream about, oh, if I were to win the lottery, I'd, I'd live in a big house, I'd drive a fancy car, I'd give all of this money to my family and charity. But, but we're not actively participating in that. If we actively want to pray bold prayers, track with me, then we have to pray bold prayers. We can't just hope that things will change but never have a conversation with God. We must engage in prayer with God. So again, here's a few models. One, a way that we can pray is just through acts. Adoration, I adore you, God, for you are good. Confession, I confess that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Give thanks because God is good and pray for supplication, asking for the request that we have. Additionally, we can pray like the frog. We pray where we fully rely on God. Or we could pray like we need to push. We pray until something happens. But if we're going to pray bold prayers, God commands us to actually pray. And then God says that we must seek His face. This is a religious idiom for worship. The idea of seeking God's face requires that we worship God. Now, for some of us, we, we may have a little bit of mixed feelings when we hear the word worship. It's an old English word that means to give worth to something. So what are we giving worth to? Because we could take a lot of things in life and give worth to it, right? We could take a lot of things and worship these things. For some of us, we struggle because we worship things like our spouse, our children, our grandchildren, our jobs, money, food, sex, you name it. If it's a good thing and we make it a God thing, we worship it. The old reformer John Calvin said that the human heart is an idol-making factory. Given the chance, we'll worship anything. And how true is that today? We have idols in our pockets that draw our attention away from God and cause us to think of lesser things. But God says if we're going to pray bold prayers and God is going to hear bold prayers and we need, need to seek His face. And let's go back to where this is taking place and where they're talking about. They're talking about all of this at the temple. Which means that as we worship and we continually seek God's presence, we have to do so with each other. So, I, I don't know if you recognize this, out in the front of the church, it says that we're a Methodist church, right? So, the Methodist churches were founded by John Wesley. Wesley was an Anglican priest who loved God, went out, rode around on horseback, and, and preached the gospel everywhere he could because that man loved Jesus. But Wesley was famous for saying that, that when it comes to faith, I know nothing of a solitary faith, Wesley famously said, because we cannot have faith in isolation. Some of us think that it's really okay to try to do faith as a private matter, but faith is not a private matter. If we're going to seek God's face and we're going to worship God, we cannot only do it alone. There are certain times and circumstances, maybe we travel, maybe we're ill. There are certain seasons in life where we might not be physically present, but hear me, church. We are called to be gathered together in community for worship because that's what God is asking of us. If we're going to pray bold prayers, we need to pray them in community with one another so that others can hold us up, hold us accountable, check in on us, and walk with us when we're praying these bold prayers. But some of us, again, we, we turn inward. Oh, faith is a private matter. Just me and God. No, it's me, God, and everybody else beside me. We need each other. We cannot go and grow through life alone. We are better 
together. So if my people, God says, who are called by my name would humble themselves, would pray, would seek my face, and then what was the the fourth thing? Turn. Turn from their wicked ways. There's there's four, four things we need to do to turn from our wicked ways. We need to recognize our sin. I I have bad news for us this morning. Bad news. Everybody in this room is a sinner. And and if you're not, you're lying, which means you've committed a sin. (laughs) Join the club. Welcome to the club. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When it uses the word all in Romans, who is this talking about? Everybody. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That means we need to recognize that we are sinners, which means we need to recognize the sin we have in our life. There's sins of omission, what we do not do that we should do. There's sins of commission where we do, in fact, do the things we should not do. And then there's those sins of accident, right, where we didn't intend to not do or do something, but something just happens. Like if you get into an accident and the first word out of your mouth is not God-honoring. It may be a sin, but it was an accident. We, we have sin in our life. But the beautiful thing about it is, yet while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. So, for all have fallen short of the glory of God, and the bad news too is that the wages of sin is death. So if we sin, and we've all sinned, then sin leads to death, and death is not just physical, but it's spiritual. It separates us from God for all of eternity. But again, thanks be to God who sends Jesus to die in our stead so that every sinner can become a saint because every sinner needs a Savior. So the good news is that when we begin to recognize our sin, we turn from our wicked ways when we repent. Repentance is recognition and turning around from so that we can begin to then remove sin from our life. Now, let me clarify something real quick. We don't need to get cleaned up to come to church. We don't need to get our life together and stop being a sinning, lying hypocrite to come to church. No, we come to church to get cleaned up. So praise be to God that you are sitting next to a hypocrite. Praise be to God that this is a place that is safe for sinners. Praise be to God that this is a community of people who are a little messed up because we are a work in progress. God meets us where we're at, does not leave us where we're at, but draws us home to the Savior. So hear the good news this morning, church, that yet while we were still sinners, Christ dies for us. So that all who believe in their hearts that Christ has died for them and has confessed with their mouth, then all who call on the name of Jesus Christ will be saved. Thanks be to God. So for us to turn from our wicked ways, we must recognize our sin. We must repent of our sin. We must remove our sin. And then we must return to the Father. Because when we do these things, God gives us the then statement. If we are humble, pray, worship, repent, then God will hear from heaven. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, church, but your prayers do not fall on deaf ears. God hears your prayers. God forgives our sins. So hear me, there is no sin nor sinner who are too far from the love of God. The sins that you have in your life can and will be forgiven in Christ because He is more than sufficient. But we must recognize, we must repent, we must remove, we must return. And God will hear, God will forgive, and God will heal. And for some of us, we need that healing this morning. We're praying bold prayers that God would show up and bring healing, that God would bring forgiveness, that God would bring presence. And hear me, church, God hears you. God is present with you. God 
has and will continue to forgive you and God will continue to heal you. So church family, hear me this morning. God's eyes are opened to you. He sees you. God's ears are opened to you because He hears you. God knows your inner thoughts and He knows your outer actions. He sees all of you and He loves you all the same. God is present in your life. He sees your shortcomings and He loves you all the same. So church family, if we want to pray bold prayers, we need to believe the gospel. We need to believe that Jesus is more than enough. That he saves our soul, he forgives our sins, he heals our life. So as we go forward today, here's what we need to do. Here's our action steps, church. Together, you and I need to do these four things. And we've talked about them already, so let me repeat. We need to be humble. Yeah, we must humble ourselves before the Lord. We need to pray. We must pray for God's strength, God's grace, God's mercy and might, as well as God's salvation. We must seek God in worship, and we must be amongst fellow believers. And finally, we must turn from our sin. We must recognize it, repent of it, remove it, so that we can all return to our God. Let's pray. Our God and Father, this morning as we come to you, Lord, help us to be those who answer your call in this statement, this prayer, conversation between yourself and King Solomon. Help us today, Father, to be those who are humble. Because in order to pray bold prayers, It can't be all about us. We must humble ourselves and be in your will. We must make it a daily practice to lift up our prayers by seeking after you, by confessing our sin to you, by adoring you and giving you thanks as we look for our daily bread. God, we must seek you in worship, and worship can't be just 60 minutes on a Sunday. No, God, worship must be an attitude where we are daily engaging and seeking after your face. By coming to know you through your word and through conversations that are had with you and with others. And God, our Father, today, may we turn from our sin. May we recognize it, repent of it, remove it, and return to you. For God, you are good. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for his life, for his death, and for his resurrection. For at the cross, he takes our sin. He dies in our stead, and he affords to us new life. So, Lord, help us live into the new life that we find in Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.